Welcome to Palm Passion Sunday at Christ Church, the start of Holy Week, the very heart of our Christian faith. So glad you're joining us. And if you happen to be in the vicinity of New York City, I hope you can find your way to Christ Church on Maundy Thursday, when we'll gather in our restored sanctuary in remembrance of Jesus' last meal with his friends as we share a light Mediterranean fare, a returning signature event at Christ Church. And then at 12.30 on Good Friday, join us as we contemplate the last hours of Jesus' life. Come Easter Sunday, we'll welcome the dawn at 7 a.m. in a candlelight service and the first Eucharist of Easter. The morning unfolds with breakfast and Easter egg hunt at 10 a.m. and our Easter celebration with orchestra and choir at 11, followed by our Easter feast. Find these details and a program for today's service at ChristChurchNYC.online. But now let's begin our worship as Dr. Lee reminds us how Jesus' final week began. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Pray with me as we join our hearts and minds in praise and thanksgiving. Humble and riding on a donkey, we greet you, acclaimed by crowds and caroled by children. We cheer you, moving from the peace of the countryside to the corridors of power. We salute you, Christ our Lord. You are giving the beast of burden a new dignity. You are giving majesty a new face. You are giving those who long for redemption a new song to sing. With them, with heart and voice, we shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord.
As Holy Week begins on Palm Sunday, we have the opportunity to consider the full sweep of Jesus' last week in preparation for a more intimate contemplation of his final meal with his friends on Monday, Thursday, and his last hours of life on Good Friday. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise him with our lips, but may follow him in the way of the cross. Amen. With poetic flair, Paul summarizes the meaning in Jesus' death and resurrection. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, for the Word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved and agitated. And then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and he prayed, my father, if this is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and he prayed, my father, if this can pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests to the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus, and he said, Greetings! Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. And then they came and they laid hands on Jesus and they arrested him. And suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on the sword, drew it and stuck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. 
And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat at the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all of the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at least two came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, have you no answer? What is it they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under the oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do you still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him and said, you were also with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you were also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field 
as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the Field of Blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. They then led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they'd crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. 
Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They'd followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there, opposite the tomb.
If you happen to be in New York City, I'd make a suggestion for how you could spend an hour or two today or another day during Holy Week. Starting at Central Park, which is just a few blocks from here, take a leisurely walk down Fifth Avenue, traveling south away from the park and the Plaza Hotel. This reverses the same route as the famous Easter Parade, but done with a very different intention. I'd suggest taking this stroll as a kind of mini pilgrimage. Enjoy the early spring weather if possible, but continue pondering the mystery within the story we're telling today. For instance, you could hold the idea that Jerusalem was a jam-packed, bustling crossroads for commerce, and within the walls stood one of the wonders of the world of the day, King Herod's magnificent temple and the Temple Mount an immense and astonishing human achievement. The city was a cosmopolitan melting pot. Herod was a master builder, and it reflected his ambitions for place and power within the Roman Empire. Jerusalem was imposing and inspiring and chock full of human aspiration of every kind. On your Fifth Avenue stroll, make note of the impressive emporiums to commerce and the monumental scale of the street and buildings. Note how towers dwarf a few churches, past Bergdorf's and Tiffany's and Trump and high-end designers. Slowly flow down the walk until you reach the promenade at Rockefeller Center. Standing at the curb for a moment, look towards the slender, elegant tower of 30 Rock the site of many popular television and video streams. Perhaps the architecture will strike you as it did me one fine bright day nearly four decades ago now, like the nave of an immense cathedral, the tower rising like the highest of all steeples before a sunken altar with the dazzling sculpture of a golden man. He floats above the gardens and the rink, or seasonally, below the famous Christmas tree. The centrality of his presence is inescapable, rising 18 feet and weighing eight tons. He's thought to be among the most famous sculptures in our land, falling just behind the likes of the Statue of Liberty and the monumental Lincoln in his Washington Memorial. The golden man is Prometheus. In Greek mythology, he was of the earliest race of gods known as the Titans. 
The reigning court of Mount Olympus, headed by Zeus, had conspired to destroy the world by depriving it of fire. Prometheus stole the fire and gave it to the race of humanity. And for this treason, Zeus had Prometheus chained to a rock where by day an eagle tore out his liver. By night his terrible wound healed only to cause the repetition of the agony at the sun's ascendance every morning. Over millennia, in many works of art and literature, Prometheus has been understood as a champion of humanity. The real interest of the story pertains to what he holds in his hand, fire. Fire has been understood as the preeminent tool for humanity's ascendancy and creativity. So Prometheus has been emblematic of human ingenuity and industry. And much like words inscribed on a church wall, the golden words embossed on the wall behind Prometheus proclaim, Prometheus, teacher in every art, brought the fire that hath proved a means to mighty ends. It's fitting that at the heart of a remarkable cathedral to human achievement, a memorial to so-called mighty ends, we find Prometheus on prominent display. Then, like stepping behind the altar, stepping into the lobby of the tower behind, we behold two monumental murals, each entitled Man's Intellectual Mastery of the Material World, Man's Conquest of the Material World. These are the celebrated Promethean outcomes made manifest in the skyscrapers and the commerce they house. Every once in a while, say at least once a decade, I've recommended this pilgrimage specifically on Palm Sunday. The alchemy in the blending of the stage set of New York, the current state of the world, and the retelling of Jesus' extraordinary story is too good to pass up. If it were logistically possible, our pilgrimage down Fifth Avenue would be accompanied by a hymn we sing on Palm Sunday that goes like this. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp ride on to die. Bow thy meek head to mortal pain, then take, O God, thy power to reign. Jesus rode into his impressive city that was brimming with human aspiration of every kind. It seems well matched to the impressive realized aspirations of Rockefeller Center, all of Fifth Avenue, Times Square, Broadway, and Wall Street. This city asserts to a fare thee well the possibilities within human ingenuity, pinnacle of human achievement, the gift of the unleashed. Hasn't this fire attracted many would-be New Yorkers from around the world like moths attracted to a bright light? Human nature hasn't changed all that much over the course of our recorded history. With just a little effort, we can begin to understand the dynamics swirly within first century Jerusalem. We recognize the players and their motives embedded within their time and place. They're not so unlike us, right? Surely that's a principal reason the story rattles our conscience and remains so vital in the telling. If we had taken our Palm Sunday Fifth Avenue parade together, I would point out how the Promethean monument stands across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was ostensibly built for the greater glory of God. The greater glory of humanity across the street from the greater glory of God. At our clearest and best, we remember Jesus for something very different than the gift of mythical Prometheus. Part of the problem Jesus encountered with his own followers was that he did not live up to their expectations of achievement. A stupendously gifted man, he honored something, or I should say someone, more than his own abilities, more even than his own life. He seemed like a seriously chronic underachiever. In the process, Jesus bequeathed to us a very different sort of monument, 
the cross, a humiliating symbol of defeat, not of triumphant accomplishment, or so it seemed. For with Jesus, things were not as they appeared. For him, first things were last, and last things were first. For him, humility was glory. The lowly and rejected were elevated. For him, the poor in spirit, those that mourned, those that hungered and thirsted for righteousness. The merciful, the peacemakers, the persecuted, all these held the place of honor and blessing. And so this strange symbol of the cross, standing outside the city within the garbage dump, a place of death, became the emblem of a very, very different sort of success than what the spirit of the time espoused. Teilhard de Chardin had Promethean energy in mind when he wrote, Someday, after mastering the winds, the waves, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energy of love, and then for the second time in history, we will have discovered fire. The energy of love produces different outcomes than Promethean energy. Where that erects a Rockefeller Center, the energy of love erects a cross. Promethean energy creates Amazon and warships and General Electric and subways and nuclear fission and cars and Hollywood and on and on in innumerable ambiguous outcomes. The energy of love produces persons who, in the words of the Apostle Paul, share the mind of Christ who took the form of a servant and said things like, no one has greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Promethean energy creates things out of stuff. Love creates a human family. Fritz Kunkel points out that both Prometheus and Jesus bring us fire. Prometheus was punished by Zeus for having stolen fire and bringing that fire to the world. Jesus also brought fire to the world, but ironically was punished by the human race. Why is this? That's the question that lingers in the air. Why do we crucify the things that matter most of all? Why do we subvert, ignore, or otherwise resist the hand of the one who loved us into life in the first place? Why are we more enamored of the gifts than the giver? Why are we like children squabbling over the toys strewn under the Christmas tree, oblivious to the one who wrapped them up for us as a wonderful surprise? The world to which the cross points is not attained by amassing our strength and storming the gates. Instead, it would seem to be attained by surrender, by discovery that talent alone does not a human make. That human achievement, as remarkable as it may be, is not the real point of it all. Our own mortality ought to remind us of this. One day we will leave as we came with absolutely no say in it. What does seem to matter then, with the little bit of time we've been given, is how well we manage to love. That's the story of the life and times of Jesus. That's it, that's it, that's it. <laughs> that's what we're supposed to get. That's the point of it. That's what this week is about drilling down into the heart of things, walking with Jesus through the bitter end so we might discover the truly astonishing beginning on the other side of suffering, ultimately traveling all the way to resurrection. Friends, go the distance this week. See the conflagration Jesus' fire ignites Pray that your own soul catches flame. Hello, Christchurch. My name is Charlene Chang. My partner Coco and I became members of Christchurch in 2019. 
thanks to Reverend Steve and many loving and caring brothers and sisters who felt so free to be ourselves, welcome and safe to openly share our story of being gay and Christ followers. We're very honored and privileged to donate one-tenth of our income, not only because it's said in the Bible, it makes us very happy that we can be part of the family and contribute a little bit into this beautiful, life-touching mission of Christ Church. Dear brothers and sisters, I invite you to donate, especially in this difficult moment. Please give your donation at www.christchurchnyc.online slash donate. Thank you. May God bless you and your family. Let us join our hearts together in prayer, saying, God of humble love, receive our prayer. Thank you, God, for your triumphal entry into our world each and every day. The slow motion explosion of buds on the trees proclaim Hosanna. Rushing water falling from heaven, flowing to the sea proclaims Hosanna. The fragrance of spring in the morning air proclaims Hosanna. And the beauty of a baby's fingers, the softness of their cheek proclaims your praise. We long to join this chorus, giving you thanks and praise for who you are, for all you have created, all you are creating. Thank you for sending Jesus, who showed us your love for all creation your love for us. He opened our eyes to see your kingdom come here on earth. Forgive us for the times where we have gone about our own business, concerned with many things, oblivious to the needs of those around us, oblivious to the call of your love in our heart. God of humble love, receive our prayer. God of grace, equip us to be your servants, listening, eager, ready. Thank you for your presence in our world, even in war-torn places. We hold the people of Ukraine before you, while remembering they are not the only ones suffering the calamities of war. We hear of rampaging gun violence, devastating pandemic, the needy betrayal. We are tempted to despair and to think that you have forsaken us. Give us a vision of your entry into our world as the Prince of Peace, changing hearts changing our hearts one by one creating an army of justice seekers who say yes to your weight in the world god of great deeds open our hearts to be your hearts our hands to be your hands our arms to be your loving arms for all who need your presence. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our world and our hope. God of humble love, receive our prayer. Friends, now we share the prayer that Jesus gave us as our family prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, all siblings in Christ, 
as we enter into this holy week, let us keep our eyes on Jesus. He will show us where we need to go. And now may the Maker, the Son, and the Spirit hold you tenderly in the arms of grace. Amen.